Oh God, that is our only hope. That you would forgive our sins. Remove them from us. Not count them against us. And our only hope for such realities is that you would instead take our sins and place them on your precious son, your beloved son, your sinless son in our stead. It is him we long to see this morning in your word. It is him we long to love with our very lives. God, I pray that your servant this morning would disappear, that all of us would disappear in the glorious light of your son, Jesus Christ. May he receive all glory in the uttering of your word and the hearing of your word. God, we pray that you would be glorified and we ask even now for your help to understand what you have said. And we ask it in the name of your son. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know if the word life hack is in your vocabulary. But it is in the dictionary. As of 2011, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary added it to their compendium of words. I'll give you one definition of a life hack. This from the British Dictionary. A life hack is a procedure or action that solves a problem, simplifies a task, or reduces frustration in one's everyday life. And if you begin to look up the world of life hacking, you'll find there are a seemingly endless variety of usages for paper clips and toilet paper rolls. I'll give you a few examples of life hacks that you can use today. Uh, you ladies can cut a pool noodle to size and put it inside your boots in the closet so that the boots stand upright rather than falling over on each other. Did you know that you could use a slice of white bread to pick up pieces of broken glass? Did you know that a stick of spaghetti works as a candle wick lighter when you can't get a match way down into a mostly burnt candle? Did you know that if you're in a hotel and you forgot your USB charger, most televisions in the hotel have a USB plug-in that you can steal power from? And this is my favorite. I've been using this one. The, uh, the plastic round scrub brush with a hole drilled in it with a threaded bolt and a nut then insert it into your electric drill, will clean anything. <laughs> it seems we've found a, a lot of little tools and tips and tricks to get through life in a broken world. And what I would suggest to you this morning by way of outlining the passage we're going to look at together are four life hacks for navigating a cursed world from the pen of Solomon. I want to read together this passage we will be studying this morning. So turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and we'll be looking together at Ecclesiastes seven fifteen through 22. Solomon writes this, I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Do not be excessively righteous, and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? Do not be excessively wicked, and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you grasp one thing and also not let go of the other, for the one who fears God comes forth with both of them. Wisdom strengthens a wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. Also, do not take seriously all words which are spoken, so that you will not hear your servant cursing you. For you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. And that is our text of God's word that we will be studying this morning. And if it were not for our regular practice of consecutively walking through the Bible verse by verse, I would never pick this passage to preach. In fact, you might have listened to me read that just now, or maybe you've been reading through the book of Ecclesiastes as we study it together, and you think, should this book be in my Bible? Should these verses be in my Bible? What exactly is Solomon getting at here? 
what I want to do is think about some of the backdrop to Ecclesiastes before we get to the nitty-gritty of what do these words mean. Let's think about the background. Uh, In Solomon's mind, the primary backdrop for Ecclesiastes is God's creation of man, man's fall, and God's curse. Uh, We've been talking about this a lot through the book of Ecclesiastes. I would refer you back to Genesis chapter 3 and to the previous messages in this book. We understood that man is not now the way he is originally created by God. Man rebelled against God and fell into sin, and every single human being since then is a sinner by nature and by activities. And God will not allow sinful man to enjoy all the glorious benefits of his created order while still in their sinful state. And so God curses the created order. As Solomon said earlier in Ecclesiastes 7, he bent it. The world is bent by God so that we can't find ultimate satisfaction in the things in this life, but so that we are forced to look up and look to Him. Additional to that background, the the fall of man and the curse of God are also the constitutional promises for the nation of Israel. Israel was God's chosen people. They lived in the land. Solomon's reign is the height, the golden age, the golden era of Israel's theocracy. And their theocracy, their their economy, their religious system, their government, all had a constitution. We would call that constitution the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, where God reveals himself to his people and then regulates their life, their behavior. And Ecclesiastes happens against the backdrop of that constitutional foundation For Israel, that is God's promises for God's people in their promised land. And Deuteronomy is uh, really that heartwarming, maybe the Romans of the Old Testament, that, that foundational book where God reveals himself by grace to enter into relationship with his people and then tells them how he wants them to live. I want to give you some of the themes that come out of the book of Deuteronomy that I think give a backdrop to what Solomon is saying here in Ecclesiastes 7. And specifically, these are promises for prosperity and long life on the basis of obedience. Right? This is God's promise to his people in the land of Israel at the time that if they will walk in his ways, if they will be wise according to his word, if they will be faithful to obey his commands, life's going to be easier. Yes, we're under the curse. Yes, we live in a broken world. And yes, you're all sinners. And yet God in his grace and his kindness revealed himself to his people and said, listen, life's going to go better even in this cursed world, even for you sinners, if you will do things my way. Listen to these promises. Deuteronomy 440. So you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I am giving you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may live long on the land which the Lord your God is giving you for all time. Deuteronomy 5.33, you shall walk in all the way which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you will possess. Deuteronomy 11.8 and 9, You shall therefore keep every commandment which I am commanding you today so that you may be strong and go in and possess the land into which you are about to cross to possess it so that you may prolong your days on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and to their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. Deuteronomy 25, 15. You shall have a full and just weight. You shall have a full and just measure that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Deuteronomy 32, 46 and 47. He said to them, Take to your heart all the words which I am warning you today, which you shall command your sons to observe carefully, even all the words of this law. For it is not an idle word for you. Indeed, it is your life. And by this word you will prolong your days in the land which you are about to cross the Jordan to possess. Pretty remarkable promises. In fact, there's a whole section, a whole chapter that that Moses gives in this swan song called Deuteronomy, his last sermon to the people before they enter the land, of blessings for obedience in the land. 
and a whole other section devoted to the curses for disobedience. And you can read Deuteronomy 28 and 29 for those lists of here's what will happen to you if you obey my word and here's what's going to happen to you if you don't. And, and you and I know how that story goes. Israel did not remain faithful to Yahweh who gave them the land, who conquered their enemies, who gave them blessing after blessing, who was patient generation after generation while they plunged themselves into further and further idolatry. And so God kept his promise to exile them from the land. In Solomon's day, they are still in the land. And the promises are there. If you obey, long life, prosperity, it will go well for you. Of course, there are discrepancies because there are righteous men who die before their time and there are wicked men who seem to prolong their days. Isn't that backwards? <laughs> That's not the way it's supposed to go. And these discrepancies to, to the way things are supposed to go is another demonstration that things are going exactly how God designed in a broken and cursed world filled with sinners. Things aren't yet as they should be ultimately. It doesn't take us very long to think about Job, a godly man, a righteous man. And, and by righteous, his ethical behavior, his conduct was in keeping as a pattern, in keeping with God's law. We might be thinking of Psalm 73. In fact, I'd love to turn there together and read this psalm. This is Asaph's dilemma. As he sings this song, he's no doubt thinking about the Deuteronomic promises for godly people in the land. And yet he recognizes that not every righteous man is accorded according to his good behavior. And wicked people prosper. Listen to this psalm. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Surely. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant. As I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for... There are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore, their pride is their necklace. Their garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades through the earth. Therefore, his people return to this place, and waters of abundance are drunk by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, and always at ease, and they have increased in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence, for I have been stricken all day long and ch chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, Behold, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. Until, until I came into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. But when my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, I was senseless. I was ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me and afterwards receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, there is nothing on earth that I desire. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish, and you have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me... The nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. That psalm exists for the very predicament that Solomon sets us in this morning. 
the promises of Deuteronomy have exceptions, discrepancies. Wicked people seem to do well. We get envious of those who hate God and get everything they wanted, or so it seems. They are on a slippery slope to destruction. And, and we know this already from the book of Ecclesiastes. Everything that they thought would satisfy their hearts is failing and will fail them. It is a vanity and an emptiness, a chasing after the wind that they pursue. And you and I would say, God is my good. As opposed to everything else the world could have or take away. The wisdom literature in the Old Testament from Proverbs to Job to portions of the Psalms to Ecclesiastes, they are given to us by God precisely to help us navigate the complexities of God's providence, man's sinfulness, and creation's brokenness. We try to grow food and we get weeds and thorns. There's pain and vexation in the daily grind of life. Treasures rust. Relationships deteriorate. Pleasures prove pointless. Everything is frustrated, and inevitably, we die. God's promises and God's wisdom help us to look up, to look beyond this world, beyond this life, to eternal realities. And... God's promises and God's wisdom help us in this life. It's not all about the next life. There's help for us in this life to navigate a cursed and broken world by the promises of God and the wisdom of God. Those promises and wisdom dull the sharp edges of the curse on creation and they soften the blow of the consequences of mankind's sin. But the bottom line is that death eventually gets us all. And until that inevitable day, life is filled with both the undeserved blessings of God's kind provision and the unexpected tragedies and frustrations that attend broken people in a broken world. And what Solomon offers us in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 is a series of helps, what we might call life hacks, to help us get through this perplexing temporal existence. And the first life hack, if you will, is simply this. Don't try to outsmart the curse. Don't try to outsmart the curse. And verses 15 to 18 of Ecclesiastes 7 are probably the most difficult verses interpretively in this book and, and maybe in the Bible. I'm going to give you three kind of general approaches to interpretation. At first glance... It kind of sounds like Solomon is encouraging us to aim at mediocrity. Don't be too righteous. Don't be too wicked. You know, find something in the middle. Sin a little. Do a little good. Balance is the answer. Uh, that's kind of what it sounds like at first glance. And, and the first school of interpretation sort of takes it that way. Uh, the group of biblical scholars who don't actually believe the Bible is God's word. They believe it's a human book and it has contradictions and they're okay with that. They would assign to Ecclesiastes a late date, centuries after Solomon wrote it. And they would say whoever wrote Ecclesiastes was influenced by Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy that preached what they called the golden mean. You need to sin some to experience life. You, you need to be good so that you don't destroy yourself. And just find something in the middle and sort of get along. That's the answer to life. And they read back into Solomon's words that sort of golden mean Greek philosophy. There's a second school of interpretation, this from those who believe the Bible is God's word, who see this section of Ecclesiastes dealing with self-righteousness and merit before God. They see this as a text on justification by faith alone, the, the garnering of an alien righteousness through Jesus Christ's death on the cross. The idea here is don't be self-righteous. Don't be self-righteous for the purpose of gaining merit before God. Don't try to earn your way to heaven through your self-made righteousness. The, the internal heart condition is what's on display here, and, and this is all about how to get to heaven I would suggest that that interpretation, while theologically sound and, and suited for the rest of what the scriptures teach about how to get to heaven, is not what Solomon has in mind here. It doesn't quite fit the context. The third sort of interpretive school here is what Solomon is after 
is the eschewing of an excessive pursuit of the right way to live or wise living in an attempt to extend life and bring about prosperity and sort of outsmart the curse. And then what he warns against the other way is, oh, okay, I guess I can outsmart the curse by being a goody two-shoes. I'm just going to give up and go after everything the world has to offer. Just pursue wickedness. And Solomon here is saying, both of those are danger zones. Solomon is most assuredly not encouraging us to sin a little just for the sake of being balanced. How do we know this? I want to show you from the details in the text as well as the context surrounding that Solomon here is encouraging us not to try to outdo the curse by the rightest way to live or the wisest way to live. Let's look at some details. First of all, notice what he says in verse 15. I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility. Solomon has lived a long time, wisest guy on the earth that's ever lived, and he has searched out everything and found Everything to be vanity, a chasing after the wind. And here's something else he's seen, verse 15. A righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. You mean a guy who read Deuteronomy and did everything by the book who still died early? Solomon says, yeah, I've seen that. And a wicked guy who, who didn't read Deuteronomy who did whatever he wanted to do in rebellion against God and, and he seemed to get everything he ever wanted. Yeah, Asaph saw that. David saw it, Psalm 37. And Solomon saw it, Ecclesiastes 7.15. You've probably seen that. You've probably wondered at the people around you who hate Christ, who seem to get everything they ever wanted, and you think, well, why have I been so godly? <laughs> Notice what he says about them. A righteous man who perishes. A righteous man who dies early. And a wicked man who prolongs his days. Uh, What's in view here for Solomon is not how to get to heaven. This isn't an entrance into eternal life kind of conversation. This is a temporal existence kind of conversation. The righteous man leaves this world early. The wicked man stays here a little longer. This is about temporal existence. This isn't about how is a sinner to be made right before a holy God. This is not how to get to heaven. It's clearly talking about the end of an earthly existence. There's no mention of what happens to the righteous man afterwards or the wicked man afterwards. In verse 15, the wicked man prolongs his life. Again, clearly talking about his earthly existence. And the only difference here between Psalm 73 and Ecclesiastes 7.15 is that Psalm 73 moves past the temporal to the eternal. Asaph comes to his senses when he encounters God in his temple, when he becomes a worshiper once again and puts everything in the right perspective and he gets an eternal glimpse of the life of the wicked. Solomon doesn't move there yet. He will at the end of Ecclesiastes. Notice in verse 16 the command... Do not be excessively righteous. And Solomon here does not have in view the internal heart condition of a man, but his outward ethical behavior, his conformity to a set of, a set of ethical standards. Uh, the word for righteous, uh, we often think of that in terms of a New Testament doctrine of justification by faith and being declared righteous on the basis of Jesus' blood. But At its base, at its root here, it simply means rightness of living and activity. Justice is the same root word. And the verb form here is interesting. It's a causative verb. The idea is, don't think you can cause yourself to be right to excess. And this adverb, excessively, help us understand that this is something that goes beyond God's prescriptions. Right? We could never be excessively righteous if what we mean by that is pleasing the Lord, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Same prescription, Old Testament, New Testament, greatest command. Love God with everything that you have, all the time, all your resources, every ounce of energy you have. We can never do that to excess. (laughs) This is not a plea for mediocrity in your pursuit of God, (laughs) It's not a plea for mediocrity in your pursuit of that which is pleasing to God. 
This is not a plea for mediocrity and a pursuit of sanctification, if we use the New Testament language for that. What he has here by being excessively righteous is to go past the prescriptions. To try to think of a way to live righter than what God prescribes. Or especially the idea of making yourself right unto excess is a self-prescribed set of instructions for living life in a wise way, in a right way, that will defeat the curse. That's what Solomon has in his sights. There's a clue here to this intent in verse 16. Do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? If you set your heart on being the wisest guy in the whole world, first of all, you can't because Solomon already did and he's the one giving these instructions. But you and I could try to be the expert in something, thinking that if I just fine-tune this course of life, then I can take away the effects of the curse and maybe bring in those Deuteronomic promises. In fact, if I read Deuteronomy and God says, follow my prescriptions and you get to live long and you get to prosper, then if I follow them tighter or even add some more or figure out what's even more wise or more right, then I can live longer and prosper more. That is what Solomon means by to excess and ruining yourself. It is a self-generated, excessive pursuit of right living and self-made, over-the-top, wise living. Maybe the harder I try at this right living thing, the more I can reduce the hardships that life presents. It is excessive, self-generated rightness of living that Solomon says will bring about your ruin. And I'll give you an example from the pages of Scripture. God has a Sabbath principle. We read from it in Hebrews chapter 4. He patterned it after his own resting from his works in the week of creation. Under Mosaic law, he gave the Israelites specific regulations about how to carry out that principle, how to find rest in him through a very physical, tangible way that one day a week the animals would rest, the servants would rest, and that was God's gift to his people. And you and I in Christ Jesus, as this theme is expanded and unfolded in Scripture, we have our rest from works of righteousness. We have our rest in Jesus Christ, and there is a coming rest yet to come when we enter into our rest in the eternal state. God's principles, God's regulations, and what did man do with the principle and the regulation? Man added to it. Okay, uh, God believes in rest, it's a gift to us, and here's Mosaic law for resting, and if, we're gonna, if that's the right thing to do, and, and being right will prolong my life, I want to be righter and live longer. So we're going to count our steps. We're going to limit how many steps one can take on a Saturday. We're going to limit how much wood could be carried, how, how many twigs by weight or by number could be carried on a Saturday. Because if not working on a Saturday is right, then not carrying six and a half twigs is righter and I'll live longer. And the idea was this fine-tuning of the principles and prescriptions of God to, to tweak this thing and beat the curse. And I think we do this. Now, I, I recognize I, I run the risk this morning of stepping on all of our toes. We all have areas of interest, and we all have life hacks we all have ways we try to beat the frustrations of life and eradicate effects of the curse and uh, sort of ameliorate the consequences of human depravity and the sin uh, that we all suffer from. And sometimes we take a, a biblical principle or a biblical command, like your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, principle. Therefore, glorify God in your body, command. And there's a room full of potential applications of the principle and that command for what we might do. 
And it's right for us to be intentional and think about how that principle and that prescription work out in real life. That's important. I don't want to take away from being intentional about following God's directives there. But I think it's possible to be excessively self-generating a right kind of living by which we measure how can we defeat the curse. And if other people aren't applying that same principle and same prescription the way I'm doing, they're clearly not living right. They're clearly not living wise. Right? Think about all of the fads that come and go with nutrition and supplements and diets. God's way to do this. God's way to do that. And it's the way, it's, it's right, it's wise, and anybody that's not doing that clearly hasn't discovered God's way of extending life and being blessed. If I take that principle, the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and I want to apply that to a rule for myself, like don't smoke cigarettes, we might all say, oh, that's easy, I gave that up yesterday, no problem there then I might move a little bit farther and say, if particulates are bad for my lungs, and I saw that lung they cut open, you know, they put, you know, put two cigarettes in a, in a cadaver lung and in and out, breathing out, and then they looked at what it did after like one pack of cigarettes. Man, I don't want that. Particulates are bad. So if my body's a temple of the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to smoke cigarettes, and I'm not going to smoke secondhand so I'm going to do everything I can to avoid secondhand smoke. In fact, what I think I need to do is not leave my purified air environments without a mask. You can create a, a bubble around yourself to protect yourself from the bad things so that you can live longer and you're living righter than the person who just quit smoking. I've never smoked and I refuse to inhale secondhand smoke and I've got these extra layers to live righter, to live longer, to be wise. And if the goal is no particulates into my lungs, then I can start a campaign that that should be everybody else's goal too, an awareness campaign, bumper stickers, advertising, protests, federal legislation. And we can ameliorate the facts of the curse if we just live wisely. This is what Solomon has in mind, an excessive adherence to some self-made standard of right living, some self-made standard of what is wise. That's the overly wise, right? Wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. That's going to lead us to where we need to be. But Solomon knows something about us. Look at verse 17. He says, and do not be excessively wicked and don't be a fool. He knows what we would love to do with verse 16. Don't make yourself excessively righteous and, and don't make yourself excessively wise. What would my flesh love to do with those warnings? Oh, great. No rules. Just do whatever I want. And Solomon says, you'll die early going down that road. And the verb form in verse 17 is different than the other two, while the first two were all about uh, a self-generated righteousness and a self-generated wisdom. In verse 17, it's just very simply, don't run to wickedness in, in, in an excessive way. And he's not advocating there. Do it a little bit. Uh, he's emphasizing uh, you run to wickedness excessively as a response to throwing your hands up, well, I can't fix the curse through wisdom and right living, uh, and I, I don't want to ruin myself by over-trying wisdom and right living, so I'm just going to live however I want. All of that is brought under the banner of the second life hack in verse 18. It's the fear of God. The second instruction, a second tool that you and I need to navigate life in a perplexing, sin-cursed world is fear God. There Solomon writes, verse 18, it is good that you grasp one thing and also not let go of the other. For the one who fears God comes forth with both of them. Now Solomon is still answering the question that he raised at the end of chapter 6. Back in chapter 6, verse 12, he says, For who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime, during the few years of his futile life? And then he proceeds in chapter 7 to say, Well, God knows, 
And God is telling us what is good. This is good, this is good, this is good, this is good. And here in verse 18, what do we find is good for man during the few years of his futile life under the sun? Grasp one thing and not let go of the other. Now, we have to ask, what is the one thing and what is the other? At first glance, we might be tempted to look immediately at verse 17 and verse 16, kind of work our way backwards there and say, okay, excessive wickedness and excessive righteousness are being contrasted. And so what I need to do, what's really good, is to grasp excessive righteousness and also not let go of excessive wickedness, uh, then I can have both. Is that what he's saying? No, he just told us to not do either of those. He's not telling us now to hold on to both of them. The reference to the both, the thing you've got to grab onto and the other thing you don't let go of, and if you fear God, you come forth with both of them, is wisdom and righteousness. And then all the blessings that come with them, the Deuteronomic promises lying behind them, the, the blessing of God on a right life and a wise life. But the key to them is not to self-generate the rightest way to live and the wisest way to go about your activities. The key to getting both of those things, especially in an eternal sense, is fear God. It's the beginning of wisdom, Solomon writes in Proverbs 1. And it is the end to which Solomon drives this whole book. Fear of God gives you, literally Solomon says all of it. Uh, My translation says gives you both but literally gives gives you all. The one who delights himself in the Lord gets everything. The one who fears God comes forth with all of it. The whole of wisdom, the whole of righteousness, God's wisdom and God's righteousness. Not my own pursuit of wise living, not my own pursuit of rightness of living, but God's. You see, if you pursue right living or wise living with the narrow aims of extending life, removing discomfort, eliminating suffering, if that's your goal, and you try as hard as you can to accomplish that goal through wisdom and rightness, you will bring yourself to ruin. If you reject God's wisdom and God's prescriptions for right living altogether, you will bring yourself to a miserable end and maybe sooner than later. And all of this is governed by what Solomon just told us in Ecclesiastes 7, 13. Who is able to straighten what God has bent? God bent the created order and nobody can go and unbend it. So what's the answer? Fear God. Be in a right relationship to your maker. That's the answer to everything. If you pursue God, you end up getting everything, a a right proportion in this life, real hope with the conviction that this broken, cursed world is not our home. As Paul says in Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our humble body into conformity with the body of His glory. Fear God. As Solomon concludes his book, fear God and keep His commandments. There's no wiggle room in Ecclesiastes for keep some of them and break some of them because the real answer is just balance. No, the real answer is fear God and run away from a self-styled rightness of living. There's a third life hack in this passage. Get wisdom. Get wisdom. We find that in verse 19. And here Solomon extols the virtues of wisdom. And, And at times in this book, Solomon has said wisdom is great. And sometimes in this book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says wisdom is terrible. Which is it, Solomon? Should I pursue wisdom or should I not? It's all about why and from what source. If you pursue wisdom under the sun for the sake of your own glorification, your own satisfaction, it will fail you every time and you have to abandon hope. But if you pursue wisdom over the sun so that you know how to navigate life under the sun, you get God's wisdom. And so here Solomon is extolling wisdom, and you're probably feeling the need this morning for this otherworldly wisdom. We need this wisdom to get through this life well. It's not easy. And if left to our own capacities, we make a mess of our earthly existence. Listen to how Solomon extols wisdom in verse 19. Wisdom strengthens a wise man 
more than a city with 10 rulers. And the picture there is a city with 10 rulers, 10 people with the desire to govern, the resources to defend, and the ambition to promote the economy of a city. 10 such rulers strengthen a city. They provide stability and protection and financial well-being for a population. But wisdom for a wise man strengthens more than 10 such rulers strengthen a city. What's the point of that little proverb? Get wisdom. Get wisdom. And we should know by now which wisdom we ought to seek. God's wisdom. There's a fourth life hack in this passage. One more tip for navigating life in this world. And it's just a simple reminder. Remember who we are. Remember who we are. Verses 20 to 22 is a statement about the universal reality of human depravity. This is probably the only verse, verse 20, that gets quoted in the New Testament from Ecclesiastes. The themes of Ecclesiastes are all over the New Testament. And and I think at the conclusion of Ecclesiastes, we're going to trace Ecclesiastes' themes through the writings of the Apostle Paul. They're everywhere. But this verse uh, gets a virtual quotation. Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. It's a statement of human depravity. Why is this here in this context? Well, if we're thinking we can ameliorate the effects of the curse, we only need to look at ourselves to know how futile such an attempt is. Right? Why is the curse here? Why did God bend the created order? Because of our rebellion. And we haven't fundamentally changed. <laughs> By nature, we are born objects of God's wrath. We are perpetrators of evil against Him. We are born at enmity with Him. We need to be rescued. Solomon reminds us about our depravity. And and listen, this will help you get through life. If you forget this one, if you forget everybody's a sinner, if you forget that, you will wind up being bitter, angry, alone, offensive, and always offended. Right? You will assume the best about yourself and be perplexed at the worst in everybody else. The reminder is this, no one is righteous, not even you. That's helpful. And to illustrate this point, Solomon picks on our speech patterns in verses 20 and 21, or 21 and 22. He says, do not take seriously all words which are spoken so that you will not hear your servant cursing you. He doesn't say, if by chance your servant might say something bad about you behind your back someday. No, I think he agrees with James, who says, if any man doesn't sin with his tongue, he's a perfect man. (laughs) Solomon runs right at our words, our speech, because everybody fails in this area. And so he directs our attention to others. Listen, don't be so easily offended when people sin against you. You shouldn't be surprised by it. And you should remember, verse 22, you also have done the same thing. He says, you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. This phenomenon is present every day in our lives. We're offended when other people have the audacity to sin against our greatness. (laughs) And we really want other people to overlook it when we, I mean, it's just a little trifle, a little foible. I just made a mistake and and we want everybody else to give us the benefit of the doubt when we sin against them. Think about that that the next time you're driving in traffic. (laughs) Have you used your horn lately? You know, honk on that wonderfully obnoxious device at the center of your steering wheel. And the people who are the target of your just really helpful uh, messaging get all bent out of shape. I was just letting you know that we sat through three cycles of green lights while you were texting on your phone. Burp, burp, you know. Why are you using sign language with me now? I don't really understand. <laughs> but then when you get honked at, how dare they? I know what I'm doing. I know how to drive. I can't believe it. And it just bothers you the whole rest of the day. I got honked at in traffic. Listen, it, 
If you come to grips with the reality of human depravity, we're not going to be so easily offended when people sin against us. In fact, we probably should expect it, be ready for it. And as believers in Christ who have been set free from it, have compassion on those that sin against us, noting that they're on a slippery slope headed to destruction and they need rescue just like we got rescue. That ought to change our whole perspective. Remember who we are. What a silly expectation <laughs> that they think people won't sin against us. It's like, I, I really don't like the effects of the fall. Well, you're not going to change them. <laughs> the answer is fear God. Be in a right relationship to him. This is a lot like Jesus' conversation about logs and specks. You know, uh, you got a log in your eye, it's not the best time to be doing eye surgery on the sawdust in your brother's eye. You got a face full of redwood forest and, and you're trying to do delicate speck removal. <laughs> um, take the log out of your eye. Listen, nobody wants a speck in their eye. If somebody could help me get this speck out of my eye, I'd be grateful. That would be wonderful. I don't like this speck, so help me. But I'd really appreciate it if you took that big log off the front of your face before you got in my eye. Right? We have an unreasonable expectation of others and too high an expectation for ourselves. I want us to think about Jesus this morning. And these four categories, these four tools that Solomon is giving us to navigate life, we can't outsmart the curse. But Jesus, Jesus is the one who was born under the curse, who suffered with us, who suffered at our hands. He not only suffered under the brokenness of the world that God bent, but he also suffered directly from the sins of us. And he endured them. He took himself, he took on himself the very curse of God for our sin. And the one who canceled sin's debt, the one who conquered death, he is the one who will do away with the curse altogether. And think about Jesus' earthly ministry. It seems everywhere he went, the curse was ready to bow down and worship its king. You know, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the blind see. Demons just flee and they cry out, don't punish us yet. They know who the king is. We didn't recognize him, but the creation knew. The fallen creation that was yearning to be set free from its bondage to corruption, they knew who the king was. Deafness and blindness and hunger and thirst ran away from him and everywhere he went, it was like this light encircling his entire earthly ministry. And Jesus didn't come the first time to eradicate the curse or to eliminate it, but everywhere the curse sort of bowed its knee to its Lord was a foreshadowing of what is to come. That day when Jesus takes away the curse for good in the eternal state. And that is an ultimate victory, not just for him, not just for the vindication of his own name, but for the rescue of his people. It's a victory for us, for all who believe in him. You know, the tip from Solomon for us is to fear God. Jesus was always in a right relationship to his father. Jesus never sinned. Jesus was the righteous, the just, the one who always lived right, the one who is eternally wise. And Jesus is the one who credits his righteousness to our account if we believe in him. By faith, we get the trade that was enacted at the cross where God takes our sin and places them on Christ and credits to Jesus every crime we ever committed. And Jesus trades all of our filth for his clean robes, his righteousness, that he is so ready, so eager, so willing to dress anybody who will believe. And he clothes us with his perfection. Jesus was untainted by our disease and yet took its effects upon himself. 
for our sake. Do you understand the secret to life is what Solomon is driving at? There's a judgment coming, chapter 12. Death is on its way. Fear God and keep his commandments. You know, the one greater than Solomon has come. And he laid down his life to show us exactly how that's possible. If you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, would you surrender your life to him? And have eternal life this day. There are people in this room who love Christ, who have been forgiven of all of their sins, past, present, and future. And they're not perfect. They still will sin and yet will still be forgiven. Not because of what they could do. Not because they figured out the right way to live or the wise way to live. But because God gave them life by his grace. Ask someone today, how can I have eternal life? How can I have God through Jesus Christ? And everything will change. Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you that you have chosen to speak, to make your mind understood. We thank you that you have encapsulated your thoughts and your will for us in a book that doesn't change. That we're not left to handing things down one generation to another and hoping we get it right. But you have spoken. And you have spoken words of life. God, I pray as we go forth this week that we would remember these things that you have taught us in your word this morning. That we might glorify you and be blessed in it, and we ask it in Jesus' name.